chemicals. We will talk about pharmaceutical patents and uh, please start. Good afternoon. Um, I'm honored by the invitation to speak to, uh, for me, uh, an unusual crowd. We look at you people as the people who invented open innovation. And we look at you as the solution of our problems. And apparently, you're also interested in, uh, in uh, what we're doing in, in uh, the pharmaceutical development. But first, explain you who I am, otherwise it becomes maybe a bit uh, amazing why, why I'm standing here. I have a double position at the uh, University of Utrecht. Um, I'm a medical doctor, but I'm uh, interested already for uh, <coughs> 40 years in structure function relationships in biological drugs. And biological drugs have to think in things like uh, EPO, uh, monoclonal antibodies, etc. And my specialty over the years has become the side effects of these drugs. So if something happens somewhere in the world with a biological drug, we are most of the time they ask us to look at it and see what, what we can find, uh, what the problem is. But from, um, because I, when biotechnology started, you may remember there was a lot of discussion on, uh, on the societal implications of recombinant DNA technology and gene technology. And that's the reason I also became interested in, in uh, the phenomenon of innovation in itself. And I, I also am active in the Department of Innovation Studies, looking at pharmaceutical innovation. And there, my specialty is the role of the pharmaceutical industry, and also the role of regulations in, in pharmaceutical uh, development. So it's a mix of, um, of uh, uh, working in, in pharmaceutical de development myself, but also looking uh, from the outside in to uh, pharmaceutical development in, in general. And uh, you may know that in our, um, in, in, in our science, uh, there, there's a lot of discussion of conflict of interest. So uh, we always start with this slide. Uh, also to show you, I'm, I will be very critical about industry. But it doesn't mean that I have a lot of contacts and I work a lot with, uh, with industry because that is the environment where the problems with biologics uh, arise and uh, without the industry I wouldn't have a job because I wouldn't have the opportunity to look at uh, the structure function relationships of biologics in the, uh, in the in, uh, and, and look at things if uh, things that, uh, go wrong with biological drugs. And the other statement is because um, I also, um, um, it, is, it is quite critical, but I, I, don't, I don't think we, uh, we, we can blame a specific company or a specific uh, uh, situation. I think what, what we are dealing with is a system, the whole system that was developed in the, in the 60s and 70s has, has now more or less reached the end of, of the of the, of the life, cycle, life cycle, and I will explain to you uh, what, uh, what we think has happened. Um, and because it's a system fault, we, we will not be able to solve it with just one simple solution. Um, and of course, uh, I'm sure we will discuss uh, um, a number of solutions and also what to do with the patent system in the pharmaceutical development uh, later because that's apparently what you are interested in. And, and my, my main study object in the uh, Department of Innovation Studies is what, what we have become, we, have, we are now calling the innovation paradox. Because our field is the field where most investments are made in science. If you look at the, uh, at the relatively size at Utrecht University of the Biomedical Research, compared with mathematics or physics or whatever, it's, it's already clear that the, the main <coughs> emphasis in, in scientific development has been in the last uh, 20 years in, um, in, 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 in biology and medical sciences. 
And now we have this strange paradox that although the amount of money we are investing is increasing, the, the returns in new drugs is, uh, has more or less uh, come uh, to a stop. And this is the key. This, this is the key uh, issue. What you see here is the number of new drugs that are um, accepted by the American authorities. Uh, I could have brought the, the slide on the European authorities, but it's more or less the same because 99% uh, of the drugs that are registered in, in the US are also registered in, uh, in Europe. And, and what you see is a steady the decline uh, in number of new drugs from, from let's say 15 to 20 years ago up to now. And maybe you would say, well, if you, if you look at 2011, 24 new drugs are still are considerable. I have to disappoint you because 85% of these new drugs is what we call Me Too's. A Me Too drug is not a copy, a Me Too drug is a drug that has more or less the same, it has a, another chemical structure, but it has more or less the same indication, that means the same, it wants to, treat the same, to treat the same uh, diseases. So in, in, more ba in more normal language, these are drugs that add nothing to the, uh, to the possibilities doctors have to treat diseases. So that's the me too. Uh, so more than 85% of these uh, 24 drugs are, um, are so-called uh, me too's. What you also see in this slide, because the, the red dots is biotech products. And if, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, you, you will notice that they nowadays put an, a lot of emphasis on biotech products. Also with the, uh, with the, the promise, or, or, the, or the, the, their promise, that biotech products will, uh, will more or less take over. And, they, they are becoming uh, more important, but that's only relative. Because, because you see that the number of new, new biotech drugs um, in, the, in the last uh, 20 years has, has more or less been uh, the same over the years. So there is a relative increase of the importance, <coughs> but not a real uh, increase. And our problem is, our, our study uh, objective is to understand what, has, what is happening. So this is the amount of money, small print, but uh, I, it shows the increase in funding in biomedical research, both by industry and by uh, tax money. So, so what is happening? Um, these are a number of the, uh, please interrupt me if you disagree or if you, you want some more, um, more information. Um, what, what are the causes of the, of the crisis? There are, there are a number of, uh, of theories and, and uh, what people think uh, that has happened. If you talk some, to somebody of the pharmaceutical industry, he will tell you that the low-hanging fruits have been picked. That means the, the, the solutions for the easy diseases have been found. And what, what is now left over to be discovered are the, the solutions for the more complicated diseases. So that's the low-hanging fruit uh, explanation. I will come back to the explanations uh, later. The, the other one is uh, drug regulations. So there are people claiming that the, the, it's the most regulated industry in the world. And to give you some feeling of the, the drug regulations, in, in Europe we have now a central um, authority for drug uh, authorizations. Uh, they do, uh, in, in principle, all biotech drugs and most of the new uh, other drugs nowadays. That system has more than 630 guidelines. A guideline is a detailed description what to do in certain stages of drug development. A guideline is about 20 pages. So there is more than 10,000 pages describing you exactly what you need, what, what criteria you need to meet before the the, uh, as a condition for reg registration. It's, it's very detailed. 
it is including the glue that is used for the, the label on the ampules. Everything in drugs and drug development has been regulated. And that, that has an effect uh, we will also discuss. The, the other is the, the, the position of um, the pharmaceutical industry in drug development has changed in the last 20 years. It has, uh, it has uh, research has become less and less important. And uh, that, that has been taken over by marketing. Because if you concentrate on me too, that means your drug doesn't really differ that much from the other drug. Um, and to sell something which is not really standing out as a, a spectac spectacular new drug needs a lot of marketing if you want to sell it. And, and another, I th in my view, also important issue is, maybe that plays a role in your, your type of, uh, of development also, that the, the academia, the position of academia in, in, uh, in, in uh, development and in practical applications has, has changed in the last uh, 20 years. But now let's go to the uh, low hem <coughs> fruit theory. So this is the um, the uh, the uh, assumption. The assumption is <coughs> the simple diseases have been solved, and now we have only complex diseases left. But then <coughs> um, also the technology to to um, to to look at diseases have also the, the sensitivity and, and, and the speed which we can analyze diseases has, has tremendously uh, increased. To, uh, to give you an, an example, when, when I started in biotechnology, that was in the, in the starting days of recombinant DNA technology, if I had to sequence, you know what sequencing DNA is? The, 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 if I, I had to spend one day and then maybe I could sequence a piece of DNA of 20 base pairs. That has completely changed. We now have the automatic systems that give you the genome of a species within two weeks. And a species that is, that is billions of base pairs. That, 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 to give you an idea of, of, the, of the technology, another, I think, very good example of what has happened in analysis is PCR, you know, the polymerase chain reaction. That, that is the ultimate insensitivity of, of uh, testing because that gives you, you can find one molecule of DNA because of the, the, the possibilities we have now with, uh, with PCR. But I don't think that, that it is only the complexity of diseases because if you look and what the pharmaceutical industry and also what academia is doing, they spend 90% of their efforts only on 10% of the diseases. I think more than 50% of all attention is to cancer. Um, and there is also a very um, uh, uh, over-representation of chronic diseases. Because chronic diseases means la uh, um, treatment for the rest of your life. And that's from a commercial point of view, of course, very interesting. So there is, there is an overemphasis on, uh, in, um, <coughs> in drug disease. And I, I give you an example of my own field. I was trained <coughs> as, a, as, a, as an infectious disease specialist, a medical microbiologist. And what these guys do is uh, they, they, they isolate microorganisms if somebody has an infectious disease and then look at the sensitivity to, uh, to antibiotics and then they pres prescribe the antibiotics. So the antibiotic field is, uh, is uh, quite familiar uh, uh, for me. So let, let's do the, the, uh, the analysis of uh, the antibiotics. You know what multi-drug resistance is? You, you read in the newspaper that people close wards of hospitals or whatever. Um, and you know all the reports of WHO on, on, on increased resistance in the third world or whatever. W would you agree with me that uh, resistance is a medical need to do something about resistance to microorganisms? Medical need? Okay. Nobody disagrees. So we, we have one condition met. It is, it is, there is a medical need for antibiotics. The other one is, we, I told you about ge genomics. Um, we have the genomes of all 250 
medically important, most uh, important microorganisms that are completely in a sequence. And in these genomes, I think on the average, five new targets were discovered. Okay? The target with means that you can design an antibiotic that is specifically uh, targeted to that microorganism. So we have two conditions met in my, my view. We have a medical need, we have te technological possibilities. <coughs> now let's go to the third one, because that, is, that needs some explanation. If you talk to somebody from, medical, from the pharmaceutical industry or, or somebody in drug development, he will tell you that it is a quite an inefficient process, that you start with 100,000 molecules, um, and in the end, you, yeah, if you are lucky, after 10 years, you will have one molecule left, uh, and um, that, that may have some uh, 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 possibilities to be developed in the drug. That's called attrition rate. So what, what you lose during the drug development is in uh, pharmaceutical development quite uh, impressive. This one exception, and that is antibiotics. And, and I, I will not explain to you why that is, but believe me, if you work in antibiotics, what you see in the lab is quite predictive of what you will see in patients. So the attrition rate, <coughs> if you look at the uh, antibiotic field, is relatively low. That means that the risk to lose your investment is relatively low. So, in my view, all conditions are met for new antibiotics, but they're not developed. Well, I think we had the, the first new antibiotic in 30 years, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, but believe me, there is, there, is, there is hardly any activity in antibiotics. So what, what is happening? Any idea? Why is nobody working on antibiotics? Now there is some, some regulation. To regulate it to develop new drugs. No, you, you, you have to have an antibiotic, I suppose you have. No, we would have to treat it with an antibiotic. Uh, maybe once, yeah. yeah, how many days? A couple of days. Yeah, sure. That's the issue. The issue is that, that antibiotic treatment is only a few days of treatment. And, uh, and another uh, reason is that the there, what we call the generic barrier. You can still really uh, treat 95% of the, the, let's say, what, what a general practitioner will see in infections <coughs> with uh, the standard antibiotics. But that by now, they're all generics. That means that there is no patent in them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that if you come with an expensive new antibiotic, <coughs> it will become second line. It will not become the first choice of doctors to treat. Uh, a second line is something every pharmaceutical industry in the end wants to avoid because they want to be the prime treatment of a disease. So the generic barrier and a, and a short treatment period <coughs> that's killing antibiotic. So it's not driven, it's not driven by any medical need or technology. It's driven by marketing. Agreed. Markets. Sorry? Isn't it great? Uh, it, it, it is, it is, if you look at, at drug prices, it, uh, the, but I'll come to drug pricing later, it, 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 it is good. Yeah. But uh, is it marketing greed? Yes, oh, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, the effect of, uh, of regulations is, uh, is uh, just uh, this morning talking to another public uh, about, about regulations. But the, 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 re the regulations, um, if you look at the history of regulations, <coughs> regulations are never driven by, let's say, some group of scientists sitting together and so much uh, how is <coughs> what is the best way to, uh, to, uh, to, to put, what are the best conditions to make sure that we have the safest, <coughs> most effective drugs uh, uh, possible. That's not, it's completely incident driven. The, the European regulation for drug were the result of, you, you are all, you know, softenol, thalidomide? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the, this, the, was this um, pill against morning sickness that was prescribed to pregnant women? Um, that led to, I think, 
than 20,000 uh, children born with, with, with uh, limp uh, deformities and whatever. That was quite a trauma, and that, that was the reason that the, the, uh, um, the, 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 the drug regulation general was introduced in Europe, quite late by the way. It was uh, in the late 60s, it was uh, 30 or 40 years after, after the Americans came with the, uh, the, the, the legislation for the FDA in the US. And you see that now that the, the, whole, the whole system is driven by the precautionary principle. If something happens, there, there, there is a television program, that's the Dutch cycle. We, we have, we, we, uh, there, there is a television program, um, there are questions in Parliament, and the questions in Parliament are sent to the authorities and the authorities make new, make new guidelines. Um, and um, that, that has led to a, a, a system that, um, that, that is over-regulated. And, and the claim is that this makes it expensive Maybe so, maybe so. Um, if, you, if you look at, 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 at guidelines and calculate what the costs are for, based on the guidelines, you come to figures like 100 or 200 million euros. Um, but the, the, the effect is, the effect is not only the, that, the, that you have over-regulations, the effect is also that only people who have these 200 million to spend are the people who can develop the drugs. So it has also led to a, to a, 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 a situation where drug development has become the, well, only big companies can do it. And if you give such a privilege and a privilege situation to a company, then uh, that will ultimately lead to the same situation we are in now. So there is, I think, um, over over uh, regulations. Um, then let's go to the uh, industry itself. Uh, the best, uh, um, I think, way to explain what has happened is what I also always tell my students. I, I'm a regular visitor of the pharmaceutical industry. And one of my favorite, as a building, one of my favorite head offices is Sanofi in Paris. It's the Quai de la Paix, it's in the, the, uh, along the Seine, it's the big uh, head office of uh, Sanofi. And when I visited Sanofi 30 years ago, you came into this big building, you had the reception desk, and there were these beautiful French ladies behind the reception desk. But that's not what, what interested me. What interested me was, was, be, was behind the ladies at the reception desk. And there were these showcases with their drugs. Okay? If you now come into the same head office, you still have the reception with the ladies, with the, well, it must be the daughters of the ladies <laughs> 30 years ago. But what is behind these ladies now? Marketing pictures. Yeah, marketing. Prices. Stock price. No. Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's. Uh, I, I think what happens. I think with all major industry, with banks, and probably with the, in the, in the, in the, with Apple and whatever, that the, the 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 value at the stock market has has become the major focal point, also for pharmaceutical industry, and not. Well, concentrate on the on the on the, uh, the things the, uh, they are doing. Well, what also happened because they have to keep this uh, this, uh, this increase in, in turnover because of the the guys at the, the, the stock exchange is that they are continuously reorganizing and they, and, uh, and there is a lot of consolidation going. On. The, the predictions is that in a couple of years from now we only will have three or four big, really big pharmaceutical uh, companies. And the other is that the, the emphasis now is on marketing. It's no longer on R&D. Nature publishes every year the number of people that, were fired, that are fired that year from the R&D uh, posts at the pharmaceutical industry, and that's always in the, in the tens of thousands. Uh, it's also the, the, the easiest way to, uh, to increase the profitability of a company. Because you, you kick out the people that do not contribute to your current turnover, but 
turnover in 10 years from now. That increases the, 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 the value of the company and also the, uh, the bonus that the, the, the CEO will get. And when the company comes in problems because of this, uh, the CEO is just uh, for a number of years. But well, here are the, the, one of the issues in the R and D and marketing is, and, and try to to find the right uh, figures, is that the the uh, you, you never know when the R and D stops and the marketing takes over because in 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 many, especially of the clinical research, there is a, the, the, what they want to achieve is not additional data, but it is they want to market the drug. We, we call them seeding trials. So the clinical trial is not done because they want to know something about the drug, but they want to get the doctors uh, accustomed to the, uh, to, the uh, to the drug, and, and of course, uh, in the end, they want them to uh, prescribe the uh, the drug. Well, the effect of marketing. I think marketing also has has, has had its own size. I think the, 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 what we call pharmacotherapy, the, 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 the way doctors use drugs, that has improved immensely in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And that's unmistakably also because of the, the efforts of the industry to learn doctors how to use drugs. But there are side effects. So you, you mean the, how, they, how they use it in practice? You don't mean that they use they, how, they, how they use it in practice. Yeah, if, okay. you, if you look at the, at the beginning of the, let's say, the golden years of pharmaceutical industry, when, when pharmaceutical industries were always in the top ten of four small, most admired uh, companies, that, then I think that was uh, also the period in time that, better, that the pharmaceutical industry led to cost reduction. <coughs> Because they learn doctors how to <coughs> when to use the drugs and when and, and how to use them rightly, but there is also a, 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 and now we see the side effects. The side effects, if, if really it, it is marketing driven, and the best example is uh, you know all Epo now because of uh, Les Armstrong or whatever. Uh, Epo is is uh, is the it isn't anymore because it's taken over by the anti rheumatoid biologics. But the EPO was the best sold um, biotech drug. And then you have to think markets of 15 billion uh, dollars a year. It's used to increase um, the, the red blood cell count in anemia. And anemia in two major uh, groups of patients, patients with chronic renal failure and patients with cancer. You give these patients EPO so that they're, they're, uh, they're Red blood cell count increases, and they feel a lot better because of the um, the, uh, um, the the EPO. One of the issues of um, EPO and red blood cell counts is, and that you know also of the uh, the cyclist, that you you should not overdo it because the viscosity of the blood increases if you increase the red blood cell count. So you if you exaggerate. The, um, the use of EPO in patients, they will run in problems as in, in bodily processes, in, in the heart problems and whatever. And that's exactly what happens um, in, in, in maybe in the US, because in the US, the doctors sell the EPO to their patients. Okay? So they directly profit from EPO prescription. That's different from in, uh, in Europe because uh, uh, the doctors have no financial relation to, the, to do the number of drugs they are prescribed. But in, in the US, that is different. It's the same like in the, in the farming, the, 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 you know, the, the cows and the sheep. In the Netherlands, they, the doctors, they earn the money for the medicine. Correct, they correct. The veterinarians, them. that's different. They, yeah. sell, they sell the drugs to, yeah. to, the, uh, to the farmers. Yeah. But in in, uh, in, um, in most countries in Europe, that's that's not the case. Um, so what happened in the U.S. is that the um, you always have a balance between uh, side effects and beneficial effects. Uh, but because these doctors 
were um, more uh, by the marketing activities of the of the EPO selling companies, they have been increasing the, the uh, EPO doses in the patients over the year, and then the balance turned around. So in the end, more people were killed by EPO treatment than they uh, than were saved. By. So that that is quite a lethal side effect of, uh, of marketing. <coughs> Uh, well, one of the, I forgot to bring the point because it's rather funny, but um, the, another side effect is that the, if, if you, that is make the, the disease for your drug. Okay, so we, we have a lot of disease now that didn't exist when I got my, uh, my MD degree. Um, things like hyperactivity syndrome, in children, that we have now also the syndrome in adults. I saw uh, uh, recently, uh, and, and, and so yeah, you have to invent the, uh, the disease and then make it druggable, and then you can sell drug for the, uh, the, the disease. Uh, you you will f you find some examples in also in the Netherlands. You yeah you, you uh, I think you, you don't know, but in in Europe, direct advertising for for prescription drugs is not allowed. Okay, you can only advertise for drugs that you can buy yourself at the at the, uh, at, the at the pharmacy, not for the drugs that for which you need need a prescription. In the U.S., that's different. In the U.S., you all come in the U.S. If you put now the, the put the television on in in the U.S., even mainstream television now shows you ads for pre prescription drugs. And that's highly profitable because uh, these people who see this run around to their doctors and then uh, they get this, uh, this uh, drug prescribed. Because it's not allowed in the Netherlands, the trick is different. What we call it, it is symptom advertising. You put on the radio and you hear, um, do you go out more than once a night to go to the toilet? You may have a problem. Go to your doctor. Uh, well. Uh, there are only two drugs, so both companies are pro probably paying for that uh, the, uh, general, uh, what we call a general symptom uh, advertising. Uh, it's called uh, the disease mongering because uh, I never thought, you know, now to be at night would be a disease. Um, academia. Um, I think the, what, what the initial situation <coughs> was that we invented it. Um, and also uh, invented the rules uh, that the industry could produce it and the, that the, the, the patients and the, and the doctors use the, uh, the drug. But now the development has become an exclusive activity of the, of the industry. And what has happened is that we are, we are now completely commercialized. In that sense, I cannot get any grants anymore in which industry doesn't play a role. In all the EU funding, a condition is that in the project, the industry should be involved. And there are also, also not, are programs in which the industry is also leading the, the uh, scientific <coughs> program. The, in the, the Innovative Medicine Initiative means that public money is spent and the spending is completely um, uh, managed by, uh, by uh, industry. And I don't, I, I don't, I, my claim is not that you shouldn't work with industry because they have a lot of possibilities we don't have and, and, and uh, co collaboration is good. But in our field there are, there, there should be possibilities for, for science driven research and for public health driven research without involvement of the, uh, of the uh, industry. You agree that is, uh, if you're interested. Well, well uh, a question. <coughs> we are in, this, in the Science Center of uh, Amsterdam University. Um, like in Utrecht University, uh, you, you will have these te technology transfer departments and I IP uh, departments. Of, uh, that's true. Mm -hmm. I think there are two and a half thousand universities in the world. Most of them will have these. Uh, valorization or whatever. How many universities in the world do you think 
make more money on uh, the, uh, the IP and, and all the other activities than they spend. That's in this paper. <coughs> Four. Four universities that, 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 that spend more, that, that get in more money than, than, than they spend on the, not protecting their IP position and uh, taking patents and, and, uh, and uh, whatever. I sent it to our um, uh, board of management at the university, but uh, a couple of years ago I didn't still get an answer. So the consequences, and then we go to the patents. Um, too few new drugs. What is the most what is the most expensive drug in the in the Netherlands? Yeah, the the old disease drug, uh, right. I guess. That is uh, seven hundred thousand euros uh, uh, per year. It still has the record, but Glibera uh, is on its way. Developed here. Oh which will cost 1.2 million. Uh, yeah, but is it per, per pill or per... No, per, per treatment. Per treatment. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, the underlying problem is that uh, the, because these are the, uh, the, the more or less the exceptions uh, at, the, at the high level. But of the, the, the last 11 new anti-cancer drugs, that were introduced, 10 or more than $100,000. Uh, and the, the increase um, in life expectancy that these drugs give is counted in weeks. Um, so we, I, I don't think that is a sustainable um, system that leads to, uh, to inequalities and whatever. Um, so what we, uh, we are now already telling the world for a couple of years is that this system will collapse. That this will not fall. Is it production that is so expensive, or is it research? Is it production of the drugs that cost so much money, or is it? Yeah, let's uh, take pumper disease because uh, the minister now is negotiating um, with the uh, with the producer to get the, the price reduced. And of course, the manufacturer says, "Well, we'll spend so much money on developing the drug and." Uh, the production is so expensive. The minister asked me to uh, to do the cal cal calculations for her. Um, the company, by the way, uh, has forbidden the ministry to uh, minister to show the data they are uh, giving to the ministry to me. But uh, the development of the pumper disease enzyme has not cost more than two hundred. million dollars, maybe even less. So if I, I really exaggerate all the things I, I, um, I, I saw what, that, what they have done, that, it, that, is, the, uh, that is the max. Uh, producing a protein with nowadays technology is about 200 euros per gram. 700,000 we pay for about 20 grams of protein. But the production cost is 4,000. 4, and the, I think that the, the development costs are, if you look at the, yeah, the yearly turnover, is, uh, I think it's nearly 2 billion. So that, that is, um, it's on the market now for seven or eight years. They already earned back uh, the, the, the complete investment. Only, only in the Netherlands we, we are uh, uh, spending, I think, 50 million euros for uh, on the, the enzyme for pumper disease. So what's the solution? Uh, let's go to the uh, patents, because the prices of drugs, that's not the development cost. That is not the uh, production cost. Cost of goods of, of drugs is always only a few percent of the, uh, the actual price in the end. I think the prices are the result of the exclusive position of industry. You have an industry that 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 is producing less of less of new drugs. They have to survive on fewer, fewer, fewer drugs. There is no limit to what they can ask 
so they ask that they can. Uh, so there, there is, if you, if you want to do something, and uh, and the, the other consequence is they only go for the uh, for the, the blockbuster market. So for the chronic diseases where people will uh, spend the money for a couple of uh, of of, uh, of, of uh, decades to uh, to get uh, to get uh, treatment. So in, in my view, the exclusive situation is caused by patents. There's another uh, protection mechanism, but that's a little bit more difficult to explain. But once your drug is accepted, you have 10 years of data protection. That means that 10 years, no real copy can be, can be introduced. But it is the exclusive position uh, of industry that is the, uh, <coughs> that is the uh, um, I think, the, 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 the major issue. And the tragedy is not only the high prices, the tragedy is We've never had so many possibilities to develop new drugs, and they hardly come. So it is, um, that's why in my title is that the patterns are killing innovation. So these are the, uh, the suggested solutions. There are a number of solutions, but this is in the, in the patent uh, field. Um, and one of the solutions <coughs> to think is to extend patent protection. Because the, the reasoning is, if we extend patent protection, there is more, more return on the, on the investment, and then people will invest more in drug development. So that leads to more drugs. Um, I'm not so sure. Um, I, it will lead to an extension of the period we are paying the 700,000 euros uh, per year for the drug. So I, I'm, I'm afraid that I do, will not buy that uh, as an example. Um, well, that, that's the discussion on uh, the Me Too's. Only give the, the, the give an extended protection to real Me Too's. Okay. What do you think will happen with the price? We'll have no, yeah, we'll know. In our view, in our analysis, it will only um, increase the price for the first in class. Um, so we look at the fixie. The fixie means how many people are cured by it. So what is the, the health impact of the drug? And then uh, um, put, put the protection period and let it depend on the fix. But I think that is the, um, the, uh, the it will have the same um, effects. The, the, um, one of the issues is uh, in, in our biotechnology field, exclude genes and gene products. But then what they do is they will uh, patent the production method, they will patent the, the, the formulation, they will patent. We, we know what an indication is, but we, we also have indication patents now. So you have to patent on using uh, bad interference for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. So that means that, that so I think if you exclude uh, the genes and gene products for a lot of, uh, oh yeah, that, that's an, an also an, there was a study by the European Commission two years ago on patenting in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, um, they, found, they, they, they found a record. So uh, one drug that, has, that had um, more than one patent. So they, they made this list and what do you get, I guess was on top. So how many patents in one drug was the record? Mm -hmm. 1,200 patents for one drug in a month. But that means that that drug contains 1,200 different uh, uh, molecules. No, uh, no, that no they, they patent everything around it. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. yeah. So the business, uh, the, the the production, and the yeah, they, they call it evergreening. In, 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 oh, uh, yeah. So are are those patents generally owned by maybe two or three companies, or are they spread across a lot of companies? No, the, the, the twelve hundred patents were the company that had that had originally uh, developed the drug, mm. uh, and they want to uh, postpone the, the introduction of generics as, as long as they can. Um, and every every generic 
that comes on the market, the manufacturer will get a, a litigation uh, case. And of course, if you make it so complex that you have 1,200 uh, patents, the cases will uh, take forever. And there are certain countries, also in Europe, I think the Netherlands is one of them, that you cannot put the generic on the market as long as the litigation case is still on. In the same report, there was, there was also the how many litigation uh, cases you think industry wins. Less than 5%. But it ha they, they, they don't want to win, they want to postpone. Because the, if you have a drug that has a turnover of 15 billion a year, every three months you, you can extend the introduction or postpone the introduction of a generic that gives you in a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, profit. And, uh, profit. Well, one of the, the, the issues we, uh, that, that is also being, being tried now is patent pools. Uh, so patents are, are made, are pooled by different companies and then also academics can use them. But in the end, the result of this, the studies we do from the patent pool are, are being patented. So I think it, 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 may, it may solve some of the innovation issues, but it will not solve the major issue, in my view, and that is that uh, drugs are becoming uh, unaffordable. Well, I will not go in the in the in the high pricing and in the solutions. Uh, uh, this uh, this one comes that comes close, I think, to uh, to the patent issue. That, that is the, um, and that's probably the most seriously discussed uh, solution that is called the Health Impact Fund. So you develop a new drug, you have your patents, and then um, a world authority will buy your patent. We'll say, well, the value of this is 50 billion, here you have the 50 billion, and they will give it to the world, so everybody can use the... Uh, the uh, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, what I see happening is a new form of uh, bureaucracy. Um, and also the value of a drug will differ from region to region. I mean, why should we pay for a drug that is against Bilharzia? Uh, and why would the African countries put money money in a fund that only solves whatever uh, attention deficiency syndrome uh, yeah. Yeah. don't they have uh, attention deficiency uh, syndrome <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know but uh, yeah, they have no time for it but can't they better get the 50 billion just to the university to research for public interest yeah. and that's it but that, that, uh, are you sure that would definitely lead to uh, to drugs that are affordable? Why not? If, if they do their research properly, they do it for fame. But I'm 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 forced by my university to patent. Uh, yeah, sure. But we, we eliminate all patents and we yeah. give more money to the researchers to research. Yeah. And the results are just usable by production companies that can create the drugs for a reasonable price, for an acceptable price. And that's it. Now I make a uh, because that's that's what I proposed a couple of years ago, and people laughed at me. Um, yeah, but I did the calculations. Mm -hmm. Let's assume we outlaw patents on drugs tomorrow. Yeah. All drugs will be generics. Yeah. You agree? Yeah. There will be a price drop of at least 60, 70 percent because that's what we see if the patent expires. Mm -hmm. The total turnover of drugs is 1,000 billion. Okay, let's assume we will only save uh, 500 billion uh, dollars by taking patents of the. Uh, what is the total expend expenditure of uh, in biomedical research? Now, it's 200 billion. So we could. Uh, in the assumption that the, 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 the drug discoveries are done by industry, which I, I doubt, mm -hmm. but uh, we would, uh, I think, still have money left. Yes, yes. 
So there is a much simpler system. On the other side of the mountain, we can't climb the mountain. That's the problem. There's too much oppression to get there. That's that's not only happening in the pharmaceutical industry, it's happening everywhere in society. In, in, in fact, what you're suggesting is how the uh, GPL and BSD license in software works. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, well, uh, many people contribute to an open source project and everybody's free yeah. to use it, even to sell it. But your competitor, the competitor is also free to use or sell it. So it's a uh, free market flow, uh, say like that. So I, I think it's, it's um, in this case, is relatively a none if you compare it to software. Because, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a lot of people can program software. And um, if you have software patterns, patterns, um, yeah, it's like a booby trap. You can just by doing something and releasing it, one might say, uh, yeah, that's my you, you yeah you that's my patent. You have to uh, pay me some money because otherwise, uh, well, so people are against software patents, but um, I don't think the big public. Um, realizes uh, this problem. Yeah, but well, well, what we are we are developing now and thinking about, and more than thinking about it. In biotech, the production system is always the same. The cells may differ, there may be another gene, but the, 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 the basics of a biotech production is, is the same, whether you make etanocept or EPO or or whatever. Um, another thing that's happening, these, these technologies are moving from big stainless steel 250 million investment uh, factories until uh, it's now uh, developing into plug-in systems. And, and what we are working on is, we call it the, the Biotech Senseo. <laughs> So the, 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 there will be hardware, but the hardware will drive the, let's say, the, what, all, what all biologics have in common. And then what you put in is a cassette with, with a cell culture. And that will bring the production of the, the drug much more closer to the, um, to the patient. And the reason we are working on that is because of personalized medicine. You know what personalized medicine is? That, that is the getting very individual treatment to patients. Getting individual treatment to patients doesn't fit with this model of pharmaceutical companies producing it somewhere in Puerto Rico and putting it in a container and having it filled and finished in Schaffhausen. And so that that and and so that has you have to take uh, some parts of these cycle out of the system um, and in my view the pharmaceutical industry doesn't add anymore to the to the to the to the side so, so take them out get 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 production again back to the people who produce drugs um, when I started as a medical doctor if I wrote a prescription about 90% of the pres prescription drugs were made by the pharmacists they were making these powders and these pills and whatever. Um, and and I, th I think the technology now allows to bring this so-called high sophisticated production back to the, to the, the place where it was uh, 30, 40 years ago. But, but wouldn't it be possible to um, um, get this message through uh, uh, via uh, politics, uh, politics. I mean, um, <coughs> well, wouldn't it be possible for the uh, European Union to uh, yeah, to invest in, 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 in these new ways? I well, mean, uh, there, there seems to be some uh, response now in politics because uh, Monday night there was a Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, parliament uh, and uh, there are people now working on, on an analysis and, uh, and, uh, and a report and, and an advice. But, but uh, 
I, I want to wait for the politicians. So you have the honors student program like we have in honors student program. Honors student, no, no, no. Yeah, we have we have in university, yes. Okay. So we we've now then honors students in the pharmacy who are uh, they are making uh, the drug for pompe disease themselves. And not until now they I think they spent five hundred euros or something like that. Have to have to the gene sequence or whatever something they couldn't do themselves at that time. May I uh, ask the last question and uh, ask to stop after that? Is uh, my experience is that uh, most medicine, the real uh, effect of it, uh, becomes clear after market introduction. Because I I often hear that people are taking medicine which were originally meant for. Uh, you know, bad sleeping or whatever, and uh, in the end, uh, it's it, it's a big market boom for something completely else. Yeah. Because they they only learn it after market introduction. Is that a general uh, view? Uh, do, you, uh, do you recognize that? Uh, what companies sometimes try to do is to get the product at the market as soon as possible. So they they define a patient population in which you need only a few patients to show an effect. Mm -hmm. And once you show the effect, you will be allowed on the market. So there's there's no system in the world that looks at uh, clinical utility in general. If you claim you, you, your drug works, you have to show that your drug works. That's all. Okay. Um, and the strategy sometimes is to go for a niche market in which you can get uh, fast results. But once it, it is on the market, then expand the, uh, the indication uh, to, to as much people as possible. So it, it is a well-known strategy to do it like that. Okay. I would like to suggest to uh, go to an end, uh, unless there are very important questions. Uh, nobody has a question. Okay. Uh, then uh, I want to thank uh, Professor uh, Dr. Luc Schreiber. <laughs>